just going to go ahead and I'll just talk really loudly. <laughs> um, I think y'all can hear me. My name is Carrie Jarvis. I'm the Marketing Communications Manager for the Georgia Tech Savannah Campus. Um, you may have known about 10 years ago we were still doing undergrad engineering. We've switched to professional education. Um, so now we do PMP certification, Lean Six Sigma, um, coding boot camps, um, a lot of different classes. And also we have a K-12 summer camp, um, a STEAM camp um, for kids. And so we'd love, if you have children, friends have children, um, we'd love for you to go to our website and check it out. Um, and this is our amazing presenter, Kevin DeWalt, and he is CEO of ProLego. So let's give him a round of applause. Thanks. Okay, so uh, my name is Kevin DeWalt, and I'm going to talk about the future of work um, in the era of AI. And the punchline is uh, robots are taking all our jobs. Um, any questions? Uh, oh, of course, my clicker dies right as I'm starting. All right, technical difficulties. I'm going to try to restart this. Yep, totally froze. I tested this out two hours ago. Is anybody technically confident here? <laughs> Who can help the AI presenter with his MacBook? All right, let's try taking this out. Uh, it's actually the computer is completely frozen. And as the others will attest, I had it running multiple times before I'm going to have to start and reboot my machine, apparently. No, and I'm going to actually um, I'm going to start talking while this boots up because if slides are really just pictures. Yeah, is anybody could help like actually restart this while I'm thanks Matt. Yeah, it totally died. I don't know what the deal is, but I'm just gonna get going. So um, so uh, my company does AI consulting. So we work with clients and we go to banks and insurance companies and uh, financial services and defense contractors, and we build AI systems. And so Matt, one of our engineers, and I, a couple of months ago, we were out at a client site, and we, we did our work, and at the end of the day, uh, we said, man, we're hungry, let's go, let's go get some food. Well, we're staying in a hotel, and the closest thing was a little strip mall, so we walked down to the strip mall, and there's a sushi restaurant. And so Matt and I walk in the sushi restaurant, and uh, the, uh, nobody in there, it's pretty early. And we saddle up to the sushi bar and sit down and you know, order our sushi and some sake and some beers. And we start talking about the day of work. And you know, we're talking about you know, what we're building and the data pipelines and the models and the AI and the systems and what's happening. And out of nowhere, um, rebooting, logging, okay. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thanks. Um, and so out of nowhere, the sushi master leans over and says to us, hey, you guys work on AI. And we're like, uh, yeah. So we're, we're in Plano, Texas, OK? So anybody been to Plano, Texas? I, so anyway, it, it's about what you would picture. And so uh, yeah, uh, we work on AI. And so the guy starts talking about AI and systems and the, you know, the automation and how it's going to take over jobs and all these amazing things coming. And yes, I use DuckDuckGo. If anyone is here for this. There you go. <laughs> I, could, I could dig it up, Matt. Yeah, so. Thank you, Matt. There we go. All right, let's try this again. Okay, there's our sushi master. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so the sushi master, right? And he starts talking about. Uh, AI and automation, all these job losses and all this wild stuff that's coming. 
and, uh, and he says, hey, I've been, I've been watching these videos. Like this, this, guy, uh, this guy, Andrew Yang, and he's talking about job loss. And how many people here have heard of Andrew Yang? Right. So this was a couple of months ago. Right. So now you know, this presidential campaign is picking up. And so a lot more people know who he is. But um, who can here tell me who Andrew Yang is? Go ahead. Would, the founder of Venture for America running for president as a Democrat on that campaign of universal basic income. OK, well said. So running for president on a campaign of universal basic income. Uh, and here's Andrew on the Joe Rogan show, in case you want to learn a little bit more about him. Um, he starts talking about uh, you know, Andrew Yang and the automation and job loss and all these things. And the guy has really thought a lot about this issue. right? And so I'm pretty, I'm pretty impressed with you know, how much he knows about this. And uh, so I, then at one point, I say to him, um, well, you know, hey, Sushi Master, you know, that's great, but at least your job is safe, right? Because we're not going to have robots that come in and you know, start slicing. You know, not, not a robot starts slicing sushi. And he goes, oh, no, no, no. You should see in Japan, they got this robot. It automatically sli slices sushi for people. It's awesome. He said, you know, people come in, they get this stuff real quick. He said, it's going to be great. Computers, ah, they're going to do most of these jobs that are out there. Um, so I, I was just really amazed that this guy is having this conversation and knows this much about this topic. And keep in mind, this is in a sushi restaurant in Plano, Texas. Like, I'm not having this conversation at Blue Bottle Coffee in Market Street in downtown San Francisco, right? So you've got to consider the environment. And so it's becoming clear to me that this conversation is starting to happen around America. Like, people are starting to wake up and realize that things are about to fundamentally change. Um, whoops. And this is a really personal issue for me. Because I run a company that does AI work, right? There's all kinds of things I could choose to do with my life, and all kinds of companies that I'd start. But I chose to do this. Like I chose to be a company that works with large organizations like financial services and automotive, um, and banks, and you know, and defense contractors, and helps try to, to adopt these technologies. And every single one of our clients wants us to do one of two things: we want them to help sell more stuff or cut costs. And the way you cut costs with AI primarily is finding jobs that are being done by people and doing them faster and cheaper through automation. Um, so this is something that I have really had to struggle with. So what I hope to do today is to share with you my experience that I've had in this last two and a half years of running this company. Talk to you about some of the projects and the real work that we're doing, and hopefully make this whole topic a little bit more relatable to you so that you can wake up and start paying attention and start figuring out how are we going to deal with this as a society. Because unfortunately, when I look around, the, the media does an awful job of talking about this topic. Most of what I read about AI is a headline like this. All right? And there's two things I hate about it. The first thing is the headline is usually like, big scary thing is coming. AI is going to take you know, hundreds of millions of jobs. It's going to happen real soon. And there's nothing you can do about it. Right? And th the reason I hate headlines like this is because it lacks context. And people have a tendency to just shut down. Like when you tell people something really bad's coming and there's nothing you can do about it, the natural human instinct is to just like ignore it or flat out deny it. And we see that with like climate change. Like a lot of now people are realizing that a lot of the way we've talked about climate change has actually been the wrong approach. And people are shutting down and denying because they feel like it has this scary sensation. But that's not actually what frustrates me most. What makes me most mad is there's always a freaking picture of a robot, right? <laughs> so I tell you what, when I talk to people about this topic, so robots are coming for our jobs. So I am not kidding you. I literally believe that when people read about this, this is what they expect. They expect that one day there's going to be a truck pulling up to Kroger's over on Gwinnett Street, and a bunch of robots are going to walk out of the truck, and they're going to walk up to the cashier and say, hey, thanks, but I got it. I got it from here, right? Like, they actually literally think that's what's going to happen. Um, and of course, if you know anything about software or this technology, you realize that's not the case. But um, so we've got to find a better way of having this conversation and talk about what's actually going to be taking place. Um, so I want to try to make this a little more real for you and talk about some of the, the real work we're doing and the kind of things that are coming down the pipe. And mostly, when you dig into this topic and when Andrew Yang talks about it and others, you typically people will discuss the, the auto, job losses through automation that are coming. And it's usually around, like, what, what industries do you hear about? Trucking. Trucking, right. And what else? Trucking? Anything else where automation is going to take away lots of jobs? 
Retail, another one. Too. How about another one? Food service. Wow, you guys, you nailed them. That's like that's the top three, right? This, and, and of course, we should be talking about that because those are like you know we're talking 10, 20 million people that could be automated in a pretty quick period of time, and you know it would be pretty pretty devastating for our economy. Um, but I don't think even people who have a even people that do machine learning and have a familiar familiarity with this technology have a good understanding of actually how deep and how fast this could come. So I want to talk about some of the work that, uh, that we're currently doing. So we're working on a project now to automate a, a particular business process at a client. And I can't tell you the client, I can't tell you the work that we're automating, uh, and I can't tell you real like technical details about it, but honestly for this talk it doesn't matter, right? Because the same, you could apply the same logic to thousands of other projects being done and people that are smarter than us you know, working on the same thing at other places, right? So we're not the only people doing this. So the details don't matter, but what matters is the nature of the problem, the jobs that people are doing, and the type of jobs that we're now working on automating. So this particular uh, job employs about 100,000 people or so in the US, right? Okay, and it's, it's a good uh, white collar job. The median salary for this job in the United States is $70,000 a year. Uh, in bigger cities, you've seen 120, 130,000, and so these are these are um, these are white collar jobs with good benefits. The kind of thing that like politicians would be thrilled to bring ten of their jobs to their city. Um, and typically, the people that get this job have a, a technical or analytical degree, like they're math majors or econ, um, computer science, statistics, because it requires some thinking and analytical skills and experience to understand how to actually do the job. And additionally, it takes between like three months to a year of actually on the job training to learn how to do it. So it's not something you can really go to school for, it's something you learn through doing it, right? So these are smart people doing this work. Um, now, the challenge with talking to an audience like this about AI is people are coming here at vastly different levels of experience. And you know, I did a quick poll ahead of time and found out there's a lot of people that are programmers and, and computer science majors in here. Um, and there's some of you who may have, you know, have never looked at computers and only have a passing understanding of the technology. So I'm going to try to like, cover this topic in a way that allows everybody to get something out of it. Um, and, but in order to help give some value to the people who are in the former category, I've got to dive into the tech a bit. So that's the divers, right? I'm going to dive down into the tech and talk a little bit more about the nature of the problem and what we're doing. Uh, but I'm only going to do that for about 10 or 15 minutes, and I'm going to come out. So when I bring up the next slide with divers on that are surfacing, you're going to know that the techno babble's over, right? So try to hang with me. Don't walk out the door. I promise you this won't be another you know, hour of me babbling about tech up here. Um, so if you've done any kind of machine learning, you have probably, exp you've probably worked with uh, a, an approach called supervised <laughs> learning. How many people have heard of that, the, the techniques? Yeah, so lots of folks have. Um, so supervised learning is an approach where you basically teach an algorithm how to do something by showing it lots of examples. Um, for instance, if you want to teach an algorithm to recognize a picture and tell whether it contains uh, a dog or a cat, you can take a couple thousand examples of pictures of dogs and pictures of cats, you show it to the algorithm and it learns how to recognize uh, a dog or a cat. Uh, this was actually a pretty hard computer science problem until about 2013. And then using uh, convolutional neural networks, people sort of cracked the code. And now it is, it is uh, now, three years ago, it was trivially easy to do this. And you can you download free software, and in 20 minutes you can, you can do this yourself. Like anybody can do it at this point. Um, it's, and it's called supervised learning just because you're giving it supervision and examples. Now, the... What's interesting about this approach is that you have to have all the information up front. So you have to have all the information that you want to train the algorithm and all the examples ready to go at the beginning. Um, by the way, those are my cats there, aren't they cute? <laughs> I, I found the dog on the internet, but the dog's cute as well. It turns out that most business problems are not like this. And most work that we do, it does, you don't always have all of the information up front. Um, most work happens sequentially, where you have an educated person that has to take steps and solve a problem. Um, for example, if you're hanging out at home on a Friday night and your cable goes out, right? 
suddenly you're all mad. You're about to, you know, you're, you're about to watch a Game of Thrones or whatever it is, and you, you get on the phone. You call, you know, one eight hundred Comcast or whatever the number is, and you get the Comcast rep on the phone, and she doesn't have all the information up front to make the decision to know how to help you. She has to start asking you questions and doing an investigation. So she may say, "Hello, this is Comcast. How can I help you?" Uh, the cable's out. You know what happened? Blah, 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 blah. You know, please fix it. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Is your your cable turned on? Of course, it's turned on, right? All right, let me see if I can do a search in your area to see if the the cable's out. And you know, she doesn't search. And this actually happened to us about a week ago. That's why I'm, this one's a near and dear one to me. So, um, if you live in Savannah, you've probably had the, the Comcast experience. Um, so they go through this series of steps, right? She so does a query search. Oh, yeah, there's a problem in your area. We're trying to fix it. Uh, or you know, step by step by step, we're going to roll out a truck and schedule an appointment with you. So she follows a, set, a series of steps to try to resolve whatever the problem is. And you can actually take all of these particular steps. And you can imagine putting them into a database. And you can map out what this person's doing in a, sort of, in a, in a combination of like action results. Action results, action results, action results. So going back to our uh, uh, the the call center rep, you know, first question, hello sir, what seems to be the problem? She answers, action question. Result answer, my cable's out. You know, next step, you know, search, is there an outage in that person's area? Query results, there is or there is not. And you could actually look at how this person handles this call center case and map it out as a series of steps. One by one by one by one, right? So you don't have all the information up front. This person's relying on their experience. Uh, they probably have a, you know, the, all, if you've looked at a call center, they usually have like little manuals and scorecards and graphics that teach them how to, to handle a case. But it's knowledge, it's experience, it's, it's intuition, and of course, there's like knowing how to deal with people. Um, but at the end of this entire process, uh, the, you know, the person does one of two things: either they've solved the problem. And, or they scheduled a truck to come out, and made an appointment to someone to come out and visit your house, right? Well, it turns out like, like there is a better way to model this sort of sequential decision making. Uh, all right, so now this is going to really get some good extra credit here. Can anybody tell me what this particular process is? Anyone who does not work at ProLego? <laughs> what, is it, what is this process? Okay, it is a feedback loop, right? But there's a particular type of process for modeling a se series of sequential decisions. Go ahead. MDP. Ah, yeah. It stands for? A Markov decision process. All right. Give that guy a round of applause back there. <laughs> Got to talk to this guy afterwards. <laughs> um, yeah, so Markov decision process. So it's a way of, of modeling uh, a system where you have uh, a series of, of agents that have a combination of experience and randomness are making decisions in an environment. Did I get that right? Is that OK? All right. <laughs> I have to check with our engineers to make sure that I'm, I'm staying on track. Um, so in this particular instance, you, know, you have an agent, which is our call center rep. Actually, I got a little pointer. The agent, our call center rep, right, who is taking actions, you know, doing a search query, asking a question. And in the environment, which is you know, the entire state of the cable system, and it's what's happening in my house, and it's the case. Uh, and uh, taking the actions, and that, the action she takes is going to move it to a different state in the environment. And as a result of taking that action, the call center agent gets a reward from taking that particular step. Uh, and the reward is basically the feedback from, from taking the step. So you can imagine uh, if the call center rep makes a suggestion where she's instantly able to solve the problem, she gets a positive reward. And if she says to the person, hey, hey dummy, did you, turn, did you see if it's plugged in? It probably gets a negative reward because I would have hung up the phone, right? So it's a way of modeling sort of um, this combination of, of states and actions and rewards is a way of modeling this kind of process. And to solve this process, you want to try to maximize the cumulative reward that you're going to get in the future. And that's how you solve this sort of Markov decision process. Uh, so now, uh, anybody know the type? It's not, uh, it's not supervised learning. Does anyone know the machine learning technique you can use to solve a Markov decision process? Kevin's muttering something back there. Unsupervised? Uh, it's, it's not unsupervised learning. Uh, close. There's sort of like three big categories. There's one more. Go ahead. Reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning. Now we definitely have to talk to this guy. <laughs> All right. So um, reinforcement learning, right? So 
Um, reinforcement learning is a technique uh, that was recently, it, it, people have been studying reinforcement learning um, for decades, right? But it's recently become a lot more popular uh, because there's a lot more companies investing in it to solve these kind of problems. So anybody know what this is? What is it? it look, yeah, it is Go, but the, the media event, what happened? Go beat everybody. So the computer beat everybody. Yeah, so, so AlphaGo, which was designed by Google, uh, was a, and this was like two years ago, uh, they came up with a program based on reinforcement learning that actually beat the, um, uh, it beat the world's best uh, Go player in the world. So Lee Sotal in Korea uh, was beaten by uh, the computer, right? And what's really amazing about this, it's not like 20 years ago when Big Blue, uh, the, the computer program, uh, won at chess. And chess is a different type of, of uh, game. And if you basically Deep Blue won by measuring and memorizing um, different steps into the future and having a bigger memory bank. Um, AlphaGo actually had to come up with new ways of playing the game. So it was a pretty monumental moment for, uh, for the research community to see that we could use reinforcement learning to solve this problem. Uh, most of the research or, that you're going to read about reinforcement learning or anything you see that's being published or talked about typically involves solving games, right? And games are a great environment to study reinforcement learning because you can gather lots of data and all the information you need is right there. So, for example, in a game of Pac-Man, if I want to try to model this as a, an MDP and try to solve the problem, we can we get the state, right? We know where all the dots are, where the ghosts are, what fruit is left, uh, and we sort of you know, we know what the state is of everything in the screen. And as far as an action goes, Pac-Man can only move one of a couple different directions. It's left or right or up and down, and we see a very clear reward that happens in the score. So it's easy to run simulations gather lots of data and do research um, on reinforcement learning. And I think that's why when people talk about this technology, because most of the information published about it is, is in the gaming domain, a lot of people say, hey, this reinforcement learning is a couple years away because nobody's really doing anything real yet with it. Um, but at the, end of the, at the end of the day, the goal in trying to solve this MDP is to discover a policy. And that's basically a set of rules that tells you what's the best action I should take at this particular moment to maximize my, my, my cumulative reward, or in this case, my future score. Right? And so that's how you develop a policy. And there's lots of information published in, out there about You can go on a medium and search reinforcement learning. And you can find tons of articles. Most of them end up talking about gaming. Um, so uh, we don't have uh, a game. And we're trying to solve this particular workflow. Right? We can't run a simulation thousands of times. But we do have something else. We have the history of all of the different actions that people have taken in the past, right? So in the case of Comcast, we can go back and we can look at the you know, tens of thousands or millions of times that a customer service rep has solved a particular situation. And we can take all that information in the database like we talked about before. We don't have Pac-Man moving around the screen, but we have the action the result, action result, action result. We've got thousands and thousands and thousands of examples of this, right? And we can actually use this and model it out. And we call those things trajectories. So a related example, you can imagine if you, have a, uh, if you have an email tech support rep, right? And that tech support rep is sending out emails and reacting to the email that they get from a client and sending an email back to that person. So again, you have you know, action, rep sends email, you know, reply from the customer, right? Action, rep sends email, reply from the customer, and on and on and on, right, until the case is closed. And that represents a trajectory. And so you can imagine if you have thousands of these, you can start modeling out you know, in related techniques uh, using reinforcement learning techniques to try to discover an optimal policy. And when you do that, um, you have a system that's going to allow you to, to select the next best action you should take um, based on the, the cumulative reward you want to try to get the, the, the best solution. Right? And what's really interesting about having a reward and a policy is that it'll, it's a very robust system. So like having human logic, it allows you to have a score and to do more nuanced decisions and deal with like, cases that are kind of outside the normal, normal, where you would typically have to have human judgment. And that's why a lot of these systems have not worked well in the past. You haven't been able to solve these kind of problems with an expert system or a bunch of rules because something always happens outside the rules that doesn't quite 
fit what you expect. But with a policy, you have something that's more adaptable that can deal with these edge cases, right? Um, so um, that's an example of the kind of problem that we're trying to solve. So it's unclear um, to any of us whether or not what we're doing is going to work. Right? This, is a, this is a pilot project that we're running. Um, but our results so far have been pretty impressive to us and to our clients. Uh, and regardless of whether we solve this problem this year or somebody else solves it next year or Google comes out with an API that solves it in three years, the writing's on the wall. Like somebody is going to figure this out. Like we're not the only, you know, our tiny little company here in Savannah, Georgia is not the only people in the world capable of doing this, right? There's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of other smart people working on these problems. Um, so I said we would dive out of the tech. So if you were getting bored there with the techno babble, the techno babble is, is officially over. So um, no more tech talk. Um, so I've got a question for you. Um, I described a particular type of business process, right? Taking an action and seeing a result, and another action and another result, right? Can anybody else think of any other professions or jobs where that happens? What? Accounting, right? Accounting, right? Exactly. Take an action, see some sort of result, what I'm analyzing. Good. Anybody else? Medicine. Medicine, OK. Your primary care physician. You, know, you go into your doctor. Um, you know, Hello, Mrs. Jones. How are you feeling today? Action. Result? Oh, my stomach hurts. Oh, really? What did you have to eat last night? Action. Um, I had some you know, McBurgers and McFries. Um, you know, <laughs> result, right? Ah, let's take your temperature. Action. You know, result. Her temperature. Let's get a lab test. Action. Lab test. Result. And you can imagine, you can take the trajectories of all of the primary care visits for thousands and, or tens of thousands, millions of people in the United States. And you can start using the same type of technology to model this process. Um, anybody else can think of any? Uh, yeah, I, I've never thought about that one, but that could be. And what's the actual use case, you think, we're in law? Right, so maybe like interviewing, a, like a client comes in and you're interviewing, how do I handle your particular, yeah, yeah your accident lawsuit or something? Yeah, 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 this is what happened, this is what I want to do. Yeah, I get it, right, hey, sir, you know, thanks for coming to my office, what happened? Oh, I hurt my arm at work, right. Oh, you know, did you do this? Yeah, right, yeah, right, da, 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 da. right. So yeah, I get it. Um, travel agent, right, you know, hey, you know, where do you want to go? Oh, um, I want to go to Rome. Uh, really, when do you want to go? Uh, I want to go in July, let's check the tickets. Action result, action result, right. So these are, these are the kind of jobs that we're looking at, at automating in the future. Um, excellent. So, um, so let's, really, let's take a moment to talk about the implications of, of what's happening here and what we can do about it. Um, has anybody read this book on the right? Uh, he'll, OK. Uh, anybody? Re I read it a couple years ago. Anybody want to tell Emily, the prolific reader over there? We heard from her speech. Uh, anybody want to tell us what Hillbilly Elegy is about? Go ahead, Emily. Um, J.D. Vance is a, a gentleman who grows up just outside of Appalachia with his family rooted in Appalachia. He goes on to join the Marine Corps and then get a law degree from Yale after getting an undergrad from, I think, Ohio State. And um, he talks about the culture shock of transitioning from very poor rural, or uh, on the opposite of urban, rural, I guess, lifestyle into this Ivy yeah, excellent. Yeah, it's really about you know what's happening in the you know what's happening in Appalachian Middle America, and, and a lot of it is the consequence of the you know in, industrialization and jobs moving overseas and the breakdown of the steel industry and, and manufacturing. And his family had moved to I think they moved to Ohio to work in a manufacturing, and then they, the factory shut down. And like you know like Johnson, Ohio, the town was devastated. Um, so it's really it's a great um, human story about what's happening to, to good, real people uh, in America. Um, how about the, war, uh, the book on the left, War on Normal? Anybody read this one? Of course, Emily. <laughs> anybody else besides Emily? <laughs> Emily and I read this book. Um, anybody familiar with Andrew Yang? Have read it, watched any videos of him? OK, all right. Um, OK, once again, Emily, can you tell us about uh, the War on Normal people? Yeah.
Yep. Yeah. So basically, it's it's basically how do we avoid? Uh, if I had to kind of summarize it, I would say that the headline is Andrew Yang has a an, a plan for how do we avoid this everywhere, right? How do we how do we avoid this kind of future? What happened in Appalachia and in the the basically Midwest from happening um, all around the world? Um, so uh, so UBI um, who, who wants to tell us what what UBI is? Any? But go ahead. I'm sorry. I don't know your, I don't know your name there or. Yeah, right here. You said you said you had read. Oh, yes, yeah. 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 Great. Excellent. Yeah. So UBI, universal basic income, I think he's packaged it up as the freedom dividend. It's an idea that everybody, as a, as a citizen or an owner in the United States, you get $1,000 a month, right? And he's got a, a plan for how to pay for that, you know, how to pay for it through value-added tax, and as you said, not taxing other programs. So I'm, I'm not here to, like, like, fire you up about Andrew Yang. Uh, and in fact, I'm not even here to debate or endorse UBI. Um, I will just say that it's one idea on the table. Uh, because we're running out of time and we don't have a lot of ideas. Like this technology is coming. So it's not just truck drivers. It's not just the fast food. It's not just the retail workers. Um, so we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do. It's not the only idea on the table. And if you start paying attention, you're going to hear other ideas. Um, anybody know this gentleman? Who is this? Emily really doesn't know. Oh, OK. Who is this? Tucker Carlson. You know what? What show is? What news network is Tucker Carlson on? Fox News, right? Uh, Tucker Carlson uh, did an interview with Ben Shapiro, who you may know is a popular podcast. He's got an idea for solving this problem too. He thinks we should ban uh, self-driving vehicles and ban uh, automated for trucks, right? Does anybody think that's going to work? No. Right. No, it's not going to work, right? And in fact. What we're talking about is banning a technology that's going to free up you know, like hundreds of billions of dollars in efficiency, and it's going to save thousands of lives a year, right? And you know, reduce like CO2 emissions. Like, there's every good reason to do this, uh, uh, except for the truckers are going to lose their job, right? But banning like the technology, I'm not even sure how you would do that. So, uh, but that's another idea on the table, right? For someone who has an audience. So these ideas, these ideas are coming forth. Um, I don't really want to try to debate what is the best idea. I mean, I've, I've listened to Andrew Yang's arguments, and I, most of them I find pretty persuasive. But, uh, but actually, um, you know, the more I learned about UBI, I think there's some people that have arguments against it that are pretty valid and worth listening to. Right? So as, I don't know what the exact answer is, but I know that we're going to have to have one. So I don't want to debate the merits of, of UBI. If you want to talk about that, we can do it over drinks afterwards, or you can look online. But what I want to address is the primary reaction I get from educated people who are not working in, this, in AI when I talk to them about this topic. And it's this one. Automated, automation has always created jobs. Um, so I want to kind of take that one head on. Um, in the first place, we have to look at history and get our facts straight. And that's actually not completely true. Like when we went through the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of violence and there was disruption and billions of dollars of damage. And we have Labor Day and we have free public schooling because of the social disruption and the populism that came out of the Industrial Revolution. So let's not pretend like this was just this magical time when we got automated, we got the, you know, we got the internal combustion engine and suddenly everybody went happily off to another job. Um, but beyond that, um, what we're talking about doing is the, the basic line is, well, we know this new job that's going to be created. Don't be a freaking Luddite, Kevin. We just because just you don't know what the jobs are doesn't mean that they're not going to be there. Uh, and that's true. And in the past revolutions, we have created new jobs. But my argument is, is that AI is fundamentally different. And if you read about the people who are trying to make this argument, they're talking about the jobs created in the gig economy and Uber drivers and like the sharing economy and the fact that millennials aren't really interested in buying stuff. 
Uh, and if you kind of read any like a real analysis of the reaction, the reality is that millennials aren't buying stuff because they're burdened with co you know, college debt, and they're not getting jobs when they graduate from college. You know, it's not that they, they want to sleep on their next door neighbor's couch because they don't want stuff. It's like they're freaking broke, right? So let's not talk about the gig economy as if it's a good replacement for these, these good white collar jobs that are going to be taken away. And in fact, in the project that we're working on, it's going to create new jobs if it works, right? But we're talking about five, uh, ten jobs that are going to get created at the, and at the cost of like displacing hundreds or thousands of jobs, right? So the orders are off. And the question you have to answer, if this is your argument, is how are you going to create tens of millions of jobs for people with a high school education or less in the areas where they currently live? Because I'm sorry, despite what you know, the, the economic theory is, everybody in Cincinnati is just not going to pick up one day and move to New York City. It's just not going to happen. So that's the, the, for, for people who want to make this argument, that's what you have to answer. right? And it's not Uber drivers and selling things on Etsy and doing TaskRabbit. I'm sorry. It's just it, you, if you think you can make a living doing that, uh, I'd like to see the evidence. But really, we don't even have to have an intellectual debate about this. We can look at what's actually happening. Um, so we lost 4 million jobs uh, in manufacturing between 2000 and 2010 um, due to factory automation. That despite what our president and some of our politicians say, those jobs didn't all go running off to, to Mexico or China. Right? Most of them were lost to robots. In fact, China has lost more jobs due to automation uh, than we have, right? So it, it, that's, where, that's where people were displaced. Um, so here's a picture of a modern factory, right? And there are two welders there, uh, the two yellow arms, and you got a guy walking around there making sure everything is working, right? And those welders used to be done by people. There used to be people doing it, and now it's robots. And what I love about this picture is if you look closely, you can see that someone in the dust scratch the, the name Ned there, right? So they just started to call the robot Ned, right? Well, there used to be a real guy named Ned. At some point, there was a human being, a homo sapiens there named Ned, working this job. And there was a bunch of Neds. And now Ned is a robot. So when Ned left this job, uh, there was a 50% chance that Ned reskilled and got a job doing something else. But that job that Ned got is almost certainly at a lower pay with worse benefits than the job he lost in the factory. Okay? That's the best outcome for Ned. Right? There's a 50% chance that Ned left the workforce completely. Right? And if Ned left the workforce, there's a 50% chance that Ned basically stopped working altogether, went on some sort of early retirement supported by family, maybe some savings, and basically checked out of the workforce. So Ned doesn't show up in the unemployment numbers. Um, and there's a 50, if Ned didn't get a job, there's also a 50% chance that Ned's on disability. Right? And I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the disability insurance, but if you look at public policy and how the roles of, the, of people on disability, it's pretty terrifying about how many people are, are using the dis disability program basically as a social safety net. And it's not set up for that, and it's actually a terrible program to do that with awful incentives. Uh, but you imagine for a second that you're Ned, right? and you're sitting at home. You know, you're in one of these three situations. You're sitting at home after you've been replaced by this robot. And this guy gets on TV yesterday and says the following thing, right? Now it says he's running for president in 2020, gives this passionate speech about America. And at the end of it, he says, we're going back to an era where no matter where you start in life, there's nothing you can achieve if you work at it, right? And that's always been our contract. Within America, like you can do it if you're willing to work. If you're willing if, to come here and work, you can have a job and you can make it in America, right? If you're Ned, like how are you taking that? Like how invested are you going to be in our political system and our government here in that kind of mess? This is freaking yesterday, right? Um, so our politicians are not there yet. Um, uh, so here's my question to you: um, Should I feel guilty, right? So I started off by talking about you know, founding ProLego, all the things I could be choosing to do with my life. Should I feel guilty about what I'm doing? Right? Um, because at some level, I'm accelerating this future. Right? That, that's what I do. Like, I wake up every day and pour my heart and soul into making this future come faster. Uh, 
Uh, and I guess you can imagine, because I wouldn't be talking here if I did, but I don't. Um, and that's because ultimately, ultimately, these jobs suck, right? <laughs> so um, there's a, there, I look for the day when we can use automation to take over the worst jobs, the things that we want to be doing, and free up people's time to do better things. Like, I'm sorry, no one is going to convince me that that young man there who's packing fries and McNuggets into the you know, Mick cardboard box uh, is at the highest level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? There's a lot more uh, dreams that this young person could be doing with their life. And if I think given the chance, the person would do that. And the same thing is like, the poor guy that's got to go into the office every day and process the same forms and sit in the same staff meeting talking to the, you know, the, the same grumpy co-workers that are as miserable as he is, um, there's more that this person could be doing with their life as well. So I am excited about the technology that's going to make, that's going to get the robots working for us. Because let the goddamn robots do this work, right? Why should, what are we fighting for? The hill I want to die on is not the one that I'm trying to save these kind of jobs when we're developing automation that can take over. But we've got a decision to make as, as a society because we're going to hit one or two futures. Um, we can, this technology is going to reap enormous dividends. It's going to up, uh, free up trillions of dollars of, of value and productivity. What are we going to do with all that? What are we going to do with that money as a society? You know, are we going to let it go you know, to the top 1% of the world, the top 0.1% who are already making money? Are we going to let Amazon and Google and Facebook just reap enormous profits while we let the entire of America and 3 million truck drivers and 5 million retail workers and 4 million service, food service workers fall into the same trap and let the same thing happen to them? It happened in manufacturing? Or are we going to figure out a way as a, as a country and as a society to take that, that value creation and figure out a way to give people more time to do things like doing art or raising our kids or organizing and running a conference in Savannah? Right? This is a choice that we face. Um, and this is coming fast, right? And we're sort of and um, we're running out of time. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, actually, questions or comments. So uh, some of you may have thought a lot about this. So don't think you have to ask me. If you have something more interesting to say, just tell us what you think. Uh, great. It's on. Great talk. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can't hear myself. Uh, I was wondering what you think the safest job is. <laughs> his? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what's his job? AI engineer. Um, so he might be the last one standing. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you really feel that art is what we would come to when AI is able to take the place of just a mind? What do you, what do, you do I think so? Is your question if we had. U, UBI that people would do artists or they sit around and play video games and drink beer or is that? I, I, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't know. I, I've listened to this conversation so many times and I'm just curious as far as like I, I believe that the UBI is probably the only way we can compensate at mm -hmm. this point. Yep. Strongly I don't know about what people are going to do with it. I don't either. That's yeah. The yeah. What, what will, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what will people do with their time? And UBI is not going to solve all the problems. That's why I'm not totally bought into it. Like, that's not the magical elixir. Let, let's not. It's a big though. Yeah, it, it, big shock band. absorber, right? We're probably going to need something like that. You know, you know negative, you know, negative, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the uh, tax you pay as employers on your um, employees. Why can't I think of the, the word? Uh, yeah, neg negative, yeah, negative on a, like something like that that would actually get people to hire more. There, there are other ideas out there. I don't know which is the best one, um, but UBI is not going to solve all the problems. What, you know, are people going to sit around and smoke pot and play video games all day? Are they going to become artists? Like, I mean, actually, I, you know, I know that Y Combinator is about to do a five-year study on this. That's, and if you read this study, it's very well designed, and they've, they've actually been pretty rigorous in how they're describing what they're going to do, and hopefully we'll give some answers. Um, I mean, I think the data to date, the data to date suggests so far that you know there's a lot of people doing this, right? That are actually investing raising time, kids. raising kids, raising and family, kids. the things we undervalue right now. You know, doing things like organ organizations in their community, starting small business, but you know, a lot obviously won't. I don't, yeah, I. What about, uh, the institutionalization of maybe some sort of computer science or something like that into our normal everyday life? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's 
Uh, yeah, I don't, yeah. I have to ask somebody else. I'm probably not the best one to comment on that. Cool, okay. Um, yeah, get the mic here. Uh, hi. Um, don't you think in having this conversation, we're also going to have to involve the conversation around our obsession around the uh, 40 plus day uh, hour work week? Because yeah. isn't that, I mean, they're, they're intrinsically linked, aren't they? Because it seems to me that if you started addressing that, you could almost, as, as AI, uh, you know, produces more productivity, instead of it being this big shock, mm -hmm. you know, th that's one thing we could increment or decrement it. Decrement yeah. actually is that the is if we're getting more productivity, we as a society no longer need to work as many collective hours, right? Yeah, we don't. I'm just I'm kind of curious how you would actually do that at companies because if you're just saying okay, everybody only works 20 hours a week, you're paying the same amount because at least like you know employers are motivated to do this to cut costs. And and you know by the way, these companies are doing this. This is not the you know greedy McGreed like sitting around the conference and like, ha 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 how do we make more money let's kill all let's, let's cut all the work these are these are people who are in a desperate struggle to survive in their own businesses and they're competing against startups so they're trying to automate because they're trying to stay in business themselves and so they're not really in a position to say oh we'll we'll carry the same amount of cost we'll just cut everybody's work while we I mean the government I guess could subsidize it maybe through some sort of value add um, I mean it's an interesting question and maybe there's a way to do this could you get a truck driver driving part of the way? I, I don't know. I just I have a hard time seeing how it would roll out that way given our current employment system. But I mean, I'm I'm open to the ideas. So capitalism and consumerism mm -hmm. has driven the growth of the big companies that are mm -hmm. able to produce these AIs and and basically the whole engine of economic world. Um, but as the level of incomes for the majority of people decrease, isn't that going to slow the level of consumerism and, sl and therefore the entire economy as a whole? Uh, I mean, it's quite, you know, it's quite possible. So I think Andrew Ang's argument is that's one that he advocates UBI because you're getting money back into people's hands. They can spend it, maintain a current level of spending. Um, I think that, you know, my hope is that uh, you know, even if people's incomes are dropping, that AI is somehow able to drive enough efficiencies that things are cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, like we're seeing with like, clothing and, and other goods and services. So I think that's the optimistic view of things. But, um, but yeah, I, that's a good question. I, I think um, people just go into debt. People, yeah, people just go into debt, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, people, people, people go into debt, right? Yeah, staying with the, I guess, most of the conversation, when I think of AI, I think of the advancements as being kind of etching away mm -hmm. at what we've already established as a, you know, as a, as a job title or a job description. And I think that what's, what's happening is, uh, you know, the, the more AI is able to, to do the last three lines of your job description, right. it reduces the person's job to the first four or five, which, like you're saying, kind of a, uh, it doesn't, um, it takes the power out of the out of the employee mm -hmm. at that point. So yeah, absolutely, I don't know when, when you talk about what we have with free time too. I wonder, I wonder if, as people start to cope with this, if we're going to see the shift in jobs go towards some of the psychologists that they have to talk people through these transit. <laughs> Seriously, no, yeah. I mean the social sciences, basically, um, the things to help coping, coping, uh, coping as we until we can get to a point where we're stable uh, with with where we've come as far uh, with the uh, with AI, but. I don't know. A lot, a lot of the conversations have been pretty good around this. I'm yeah, surprised I'm, you don't wake up. Unfortunately, like there's a, also people that are working on building AI apps to do like counseling and, and basically, especially with like you know PC. I mean, really, quite people are actually investing in this for like because there's such a demand for these services by people who basically can't pay for them. Uh, not about social sciences. So, um, action response, action response. You know, what's bothering you? Um, go ahead. Hi there. I just wanted to ask. Um, how do you think college and above level education will change as more industries start becoming automated? Yeah, anyone else want to take this? I haven't thought of it. Go ahead. I haven't thought a lot about this. Uh, who, anybody? Okay, go ahead. How, how is it going to change? Where's the woman from Georgia Tech? Ma'am, there you go. <laughs> I'm in marketing. Oh. <laughs> my yeah, my background is HE admissions, um, but I have experience in a lot of way, a lot of aspects of higher education. I think um, the value of education will always be the connections that you make and the relationships that you make. 
So I don't think that is going to change. I think the products that we're seeing now, like do your online MBA and only however long, and you don't need a GRE, I think the days of that are numbered because the real value proposition of a world-class education is the connections. That's my opinion. Would you agree? Man, I've been out of school for a while. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but you went to a good school. Like, yeah. Gotta, um, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Since we're in professional education in Georgia Tech, mm -hmm. what our dean is saying now is that, you know, people are living so much longer, you have to be a lifelong learner. So the way that that learning comes is not necessarily our traditional um, PhD system, but with the constant learning, there's constant <coughs> needs for that, that it could be the boot camp style, it could mm -hmm. be a lot, to, a lot of different ways to learn, but we have to constantly be keeping up and and we have to do that or we're just always good, you know, gonna fall behind yep. I guess the only point I would make to this is I you know this idea that we've just got to teach everyone uh, tech skills is is just not realistic and we have to accept the fact that not everybody wants to or has the aptitude to become a programmer and we shouldn't pretend that you know we're gonna live in a world that like coding camps are gonna be the solution to the, to the loss of, of you know of trucking jobs um, but, I uh, just wanted to also comment, uh, coming from multiple different cultures and multiple different countries myself, I've been living in Korea, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. m and multiple places in Europe, and I've been living in multiple different cultures and how they handle like education, how they handle their economy system and everything. And I believe the AI system and how it's going to work within here and how it's going to work with the production is going to be very, very well done. How people view jobs right now, they view it as, uh, as basically an income intake. Mm -hmm. They don't, uh, people don't, uh, because like how you said, like the creativity and, and innovation and stuff like that, you, um, that has to come in a little bit stronger right now because that's going down a little bit more and more. Because back then, um, back in the past, uh, the creativity and, inv and innovation was more enforced. Um, as you can see, like uh, there, um, like Einstein and many other and many other like uh, famous scientists and stuff like that back then, used to always say like creativity is, and innovation is something that you want to go for and strive for because it makes new things. It makes you think of new ideas and new yep. and new innovations, and it will push uh, push us forwards into different directions and stuff like that. And so, do you find it like different having like uh, now that you're, I don't know how much long you've been in America, but do you find that. America and how we view this issue is different than other countries and other cultures? Yes, I what's do. The, what's the differences? Um, I've, I've stayed here in America for right now uh, seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, from, from the culture uh, between here and the outside is very different, especially the education, col uh, the education culture. Because education here is viewed very, very, uh, like not as, not as strong as uh, other, other places. Because in the other places, when they when they educate you, they educate you like very strong, and they make sure that it's free for everyone in the in, in those areas. Mm -hmm. And that's why people usually like when they come out of high school, they always like they have the education. They're like, oh, we have a basis now. We can go go to whatever like uh, their their creative mind wants to go for. Mm -hmm. And usually, like some people would like would be like, oh, I want to go into engineering. I want to work at CERN. I want to work at here or there. Mm -hmm. May, uh, never know. Like they can make more newer, uh, newer uh, tech and newer um, uh, education systems and stuff. Yep. Great. It's all about the culture that comes down to uh, how how we're living. You know. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Yvonne. I get so I'm an optimist, and I just to just to throw some optimism on this. I, like, I am too. Oh, come on. Fire here. <laughs> I, I, I would put Remember forth, this guy? <laughs> I would put forth the, the theory that um, as, as people's time, uh, as their time frees up, and I, th I believe in the ingenuity and human spirit, mm -hmm. I think um, there are going to be new ways for people to, to make money and to you know, subsidize the, the things that they want. And human attention is one of the most valuable things that, that exists and that is um, can be monetized, and I think that um, content creation and consumption, I mean, when you look at the rise of video games and the amount of, of money that's generated now in video games and, and the amount of work that's been created by video games, it's because people have more time to, for entertainment. So I, I'm, I would like to put forth the theory that there are um, new ways of content creation and consumption and monetization of that that we haven't even imagined that will, that will come about and create opportunities for people to quote unquote work 
Um, it might look different than it looks today, and that will create a lot of uh, social discord and revolution, as we're seeing, I think, already in, in different places. But, but I think there's a silver lining. Yeah. I. Uh, okay. We're gonna have a fun chat over drinks <laughs> later on. But <laughs> I'm gonna. I may press you on this question a bit, given your optimism. So. YouTube, Instagram. <laughs> Somebody else had a. I no, think no, we're, we're, out of we're time. done with questions. <laughs> What's that? Uh, we're out of time. Unless, are you done, Alex? I, I can. I, I can do one more question if it's okay. So. Kevin, what is your opinion of integrating AI with uh, human intelligence through human machine interfaces? Oh, we're already doing it, no. right? Yeah, so we're, I mean, we're already, we are a human machine society. We've been for you know, centuries, right? So this is basically an extension of my head. Um, it probably the smarter extension of my head. But, you know, we've already, we're effectively, we're, we're, we're in these things all day because this is our memories, our interface. So, yeah, I think we're, it's already happening. Um, so, yeah, we want to, that's a whole other topic of like AI threat to civilization, you know, implants, you know, where we're going and evolution. That, that'll be the, maybe I'll talk about that next year. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone.